Four Lies. Hey guys, Ralph from Georgia here with you, aka VHS82 Apostrophe. I'm your regular Wednesday evening host here at Body Bags. It is the second week into August. It is the week that we pull a film from the year. It is my month, my theme, so I went with the year, my favorite year, 1982. And of course, you gotta run with a film that you haven't seen in forever, and that is, of course, The Slumber Party Massacre. Uh, compliments of Scream Factory, uh, and a pretty darn good. Uh, watched it last night. First time I've seen this since. Wow. Um, I dare say running it on v VHS back in the day, like we're talking decades since I probably saw this film. Um, interesting to finally unwrap it last night and uh, put it in the old machine late, a little bit late last night and uh, and take a look at it. Um, if you're unfamiliar with this uh, cult uh, slasher classic from 1982, directed by one Amy Holden Jones, yes, uh, yes. A woman directed this, which makes it a little bit more, a lot more special, actually. And written by uh, Rita Mae Brown, I think uh, is her name. So uh, a woman uh, uh, tag team on this. Uh, apparently, it was supposed to be, I think, conceptually a parody of the genre, um, sort of a spoo parody. Um but when Roger Corman got involved and uh, in terms of uh, possible uh, financing, it then suddenly changed from uh, its initial conception to being a uh, more straightforward horror piece. Uh, so much of the, uh, so some of the parody, some of the uh, humor uh, is still intact. Uh, one scene in particular, which always usually gets the, uh, the, the conversational piece in terms of just being weird. Um, well, I, I'll just jump there. Uh, I mean, the, the, the story is pretty straightforward. Um, when Trish decides to invite her high school girls basketball teammates over for a slumber party, and it's only just a few of those, uh, she has no idea that the night is going to end with an unexpected guest, an escaped mental patient, and his portable power drill crashing the party in the cult classic, The Slumber Party Massacre. Um, and so the scene in question is, uh, somewhere in the midst of it, um, you have a, they've ordered pizza at the, and I'll get into the, the synopsis a little bit, a little bit better, but pizza guy comes and, uh, of course, when they open the door, uh, he's already dead. He's been killed by, uh, the maniac who is already stalking the outside of the house and, uh, but they drag him into the house and it's not long where I think it's the, uh, I think it's, um, Jackie, uh, who decides, you know, she needs she needs something to eat just to kind of bring herself back into some sort of uh balanced perspective or something to feel better and uh and so there's a scene involving basically putting the pizza box on top of the pizza guy pulling the pizza out and eating the pizza in the midst of the fact that you got a dead guy just laying there um but it reminded me of um it reminded me of uh how Michele Silvay and stage fright and when the camera moves up and focuses is on uh, Irving Wallace. Of course, you know, he's dead. But there's a little bit of a look in his eyes, an expression, uh, the implication maybe he's not dead. But it really was so they poking fun at the genre itself that in the end, you always have the killer always, you, you know, always survives or makes his way back for one last jump scare, right? Um, here, I think this is not so different although this would have preceded stage right right in 82 stage right comes in 87 but just the idea of poking fun and i think this scene might be the benchmark moment where the director and the writer uh do sort of uh it is a bit self-aware and maybe poking fun at the genre and i think really that's what's probably going on so it makes it more of an intriguing scene and not just so much whatever else it may be. Uh, but anyways, uh, this is an interesting, uh, I actually, it is straightforward. Uh, there's not much, it, it's funny, there's not like really anything going on in this movie, and yet there is. Uh, it's the fact that this, um, the fact that Amy Holden Jones uh, chose, and rather than edit E.T., she chose this opportunity to continue uh, refashioning, I think it was a short film, into a theatrical presentation, which becomes this film in 82. Uh, and so you just sort of got a love for um, uh, taking advantage of an opportunity when there are other probably seemingly better opportunities. Um, 
But this film is interesting. It's extremely straightforward. Our killer has, you know, his identity has never masked. Uh, he does, wear, he, we know who he is right off the bat. And so that's not even an issue. And maybe that's part of the being self-aware, poking and prodding as well. Um, and he, he has escaped from a mental asylum and he has uh, showed up at this, uh, oh, I can't remember where the very first, I think it's at the school. He ends up at the school and he's looking for victims, apparently. Uh, he first takes uh, a repair a repair woman who's there at, on campus to work on something. Uh, he ends up killing her in the van. And then the, our group of girls who have already had, we've already had the scene where they're talking about the slumber party for old time's sake. Um, I think they're getting ready to move on from high school. And the one girl, of course, Halloween ask, <laughs> leaves her books back, well, decides to go back for the books he follows her into the school and then there is this really nifty bit of a chase scene that unfortunately ends in her demise and then he very quickly catches back up with the girls and uh, situates himself in terms of the environment and now back in school earlier when they were planning the slumber party valerie is a new girl so she lives basically across the street from trish and she, the girls want to invite her just so they can basically make fun of her or whatever. I don't know how diabolical their plan is. I don't think it's that diabolical. I don't think it's a carry thing going on. Uh, but she overhears. And so she, when she's formally asked, she decides to just pass on it and not go. Now she is babysitting her smaller sister there at the house across the street from the slumber party. And Trish uh, does have three of her closest friends, um, Kim, Jackie, and Diane. Uh, Diane will ultimately have a boyfriend that will show up and they will actually make plans to leave the party. Oh, ultimately, they don't get to do that because the killer intervenes in those set of plans. Um, and so you got the three girls, uh, you got two guys that are actually uh, who show up at the house uh, hoping to get a uh, glimpse of something through the windows or whatnot. Ultimately, they will become part of what's going on inside the house. And so when it becomes very obvious that the killer is running amok and has, and it basically becomes a siege film of the house, you have this sort of weird Halloween component where, remember, Lori is looking across the way, of course, you know, uh, the boy that she's uh, babysitting, he becomes extremely aware that something is going on. In this case, her her younger sister has become very aware, self-aware that something is going on across the street. And ultimately, so they continue to look out the windows, looking across, wondering. The basketball coach has, uh, has reached out to her, uh, thinking that maybe she can get her to walk over. But ultimately, that's probably not a great idea. So the basketball coach will come out herself. And so you do, I'm just saying, like, you, and then you got the neighbor who lives on the side who has agreed to Trisha's parents who are out of town. Uh, that he will check in on him. And generally this guy, this character is never really usually a good character in these kinds of movies usually, but this guy generally is a good guy. Although he, he does have some weird hobbies like uh, being outside in the middle of the night looking for snails to kill because they're bad for his gardening or his garden. Um, you know, but ultimately he will also suffer demise at the hands of the killer. The two boys though inside, ultimately uh, they will make a point and it's kind of an ingenious plan, although it doesn't work. Um, one will, they'll both run for help, but one will go out the back of the house, the other will go out the front of the house. And agreeably, they both agree one or the other is bound to get help, even if the other one dies. And it's that, it's that minor writing bits and pieces of decision making that actually do come off as, this film really does come off as a pretty smart nifty little piece of writing and even though it's really a siege film you've got other moving parts happening around that make it very fast paced this film has a runtime of like 77 minutes i think and it goes fast i mean there's no real lull in this it, it is uh you know it's hard to say his slasher is enjoyable but for what a slasher can be in, in sort of the uh the scenes as they are laid out it, it is uh there's some good there's some good writing and directing here underneath the very I mean underneath the surface level of what this is and that is really what I've already said it was. Um so I mean it's interesting. Um it's interesting. Now the boys when they go out of the house, of course, 
Uh, they both in their own way were run afoul of the killer. And it just, the siege ultimately comes into the house and the killer is in the house. And ultimately you do get Valerie and her sister, Courtney, uh, that ultimately do end up over at the house. And as they become part of this, as we're working towards our um, the finality of the film uh, and the final confrontation of the killer with the killer, um, you, you, you know, it's very interesting that Valerie, who the girl who is dissed at the beginning, her and her younger sister, and ultimately Trish, will be the three final girls in the end. And that's a bit of a spoiler, but it, it makes the film intriguing from that point. And the film is 1982, so I mean, come on. Um, most of you whore hounds out there, I'm sure have already seen this a million times, have it on your shelf probably, but if you haven't, uh, without giving much more away, let's just say the, the three girls, the final girls, and the final confrontation, uh, I found really satisfying. And, and, and just that um, a woman has directed this film, I thought brought a sense... Uh, it's what made this film, I think, really enjoyable because it just seemed... It's like when you watch The Thing. It's a complete all-male cast. It's enjoyable for that because it brings something, a set of dynamics we don't we don't see all the time. You watch The Descent, and it's an all-female cast, and that is fun because it brings a sense of dynamics that you generally don't see in film. This one being directed by uh, Amy Jones and, of course, written by Ray, uh, brings an interesting set of dynamics that you generally don't see in films. And so it makes it really sort of enjoyable and worth checking out if you haven't checked it out or if it's been years and you don't have fond memories for whatever reason. I do feel like like as you get older in age and you revisit things that you haven't seen, your take on them is a lot different than it would have been, say, if you were a kid. If you're a kid, I mean, as a punk teenage kid renting this on VHS, there's certain components of the film I, will, I would have only cared about. But now, in my age, now looking at it now, obviously I can take the time and think my way through and just appreciate the stuff that went into this. And it's interesting. So I guess, uh, you know, I, I really appreciated the final confrontation. I thought it was neat just how these characters were woven in and, and their part in this. Um, and it makes you wonder what this movie would have became had it been, you know, had it been its parody of the genre uh, instead of being forced. But then again, when you're talking financing and some of the, and we see Roger Corman's hand in uh, Humanoids from the Deep, if you know that story, um, that's probably what happened. He probably said, if you want my money, this has got to be more straightforward horror, a straightforward horror piece. If you don't, good luck. And so, you know, who's gonna who's gonna not take the money and then get what you can get out of it? And uh, so, I think I think the scene involving the pizza guy is probably the best anchor moment for them. Really going parody and poking fun at itself. Uh, much of it else is straightforward horror piece. Uh, it's interesting. So, you know, here in uh, Second Weekend, 1982, uh, a film that probably has not been, uh, you know, within your viewing uh, in quite a while, but perhaps it has. Drop a comment. Let me know what you think about it um, or whatnot. And uh, so here in 1982, all week long, uh, a couple random weeks, and then we hit uh, my theme for the end of the month, and that is College Horror Volume too. Of course, I'll be looking at Splatter You. Of course, you know, back in the old days, you would have uh, been given a uh, barf bag uh, sitting in on that movie. So that is one I have not seen probably since I rented on VHS as well. So I'm looking forward to looking at that for the first time in decades. That'll be cool. Anyhow, always, always, always end these things off with Go Bills. This is not a dream. Not a dream. We might be useful to you.